Welcome to Let the Quran Speak. I'm Sophia, your host. It's been 20 years since the Rwandan genocide took place. Over the course of a 100-day period in 1994, at least 800,000 Rwandans were brutally killed. As we reflect back on this horrific event, we ask, how is it possible that state-sponsored genocide could have occurred so very recently? How could ordinary Rwandans take up machetes against their neighbours? And why didn't the international community try to stop it? I'm joined by Ziad Mia. He's a Toronto lawyer and adjunct professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. Ziad will share lessons from the terrible tragedy. He'll also remind us of humanity's potential in the face of unspeakable evil. Here's the interview now. Ziad Mia, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Thanks for uh, having me, Sophia. Now, when I look at the Rwandan genocide, I'm stunned at how quickly it took place uh, and also how organized it was. I mean, these were people who weren't using machine guns, but they were using machetes and they were killing so many people in such a short period of time. Can you speak about the scale and scope of the genocide? Uh, uh, Sophia, what happened in Rwanda was you're right, the, many people used um, tools like machetes. Some did use you know, regular weapons, guns, mm -hmm. grenades, that sort of thing. But in large part, people blunt did weapons. use blunt weapons. Mm -hmm. um, and people were killing their neighbors and their family members. Um, so what happened there is you had large segments of the population actually participating in killing their countrymen. Um, and the genocide happened over 100 days started April 7th, 1994 and ran for 100 days. Mm -hmm. Now, it didn't just happen all of a sudden, out of the blue, yes, people so didn't become zombies. Uh, Tell me about th the two different groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. Yeah. So the, there are two ethnic groups in Rwanda, uh, Hutus and Tutsis, uh, and you know, part of the problem is uh, the European colonial regimes there, Germany and Belgium, uh, started playing groups against each other, mm -hmm. and they do As this. They do in many, uh, in many India, in yeah, we can go down a list of them. Um, so they played Tutsi against Hutu, and uh, Tutsi were favored, uh, mm -hmm. Hutu were not, uh, and they injected a little bit of a racist myth as well. I'm not a big fan of race because I think there's only one human race. There's just different ethnic groups or differences in people, um, but they created this biblical Hamitic myth that, you know, s uh, some people of darker skin were lower on the scale and less worthy of God's mercy and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit crazy, but, you know, they, they tried to implement this. Uh, and they implemented it between Hutu and Tutsi. They created this division, and they started to also use an identity card system to identify people. So people were racialized. They became, oh, I'm a Tutsi, I'm a Hutu. And it's interesting because the the Tutsis and the Hutu used to intermarry, and they were neighbors, right? Yes, uh, so I mean sometimes it was hard to tell. It's hard apart. to tell. I mean, uh, I'm no expert on Rwandan culture, but I could not tell you who's Hutu and who's Tutsi. Mm -hmm. So that would be a clue to me that you know it, it's hard to tell the difference. But uh, there may have been just cultural differences or something. I you know, for whatever it was worth, the Europeans used that to their advantage, and left this tension there. Mm -hmm. And when they left, um, Hutu were in power. They're in the majority. Uh, they obviously had a resentment against the Tutsi. Uh, and this, since decolonization was brewing, there was some you know, uh, violence between the groups. Uh, and then this built up over time. Uh, and what culminated in 1994 was sort of a systematic, designed attempt to wipe out the Tutsi mm -hmm. using propaganda, uh, mobilizing people, uh, dehumanizing the Tutsi, and storing weapons and getting militias and others ready to kill. Mm -hmm. So how did they, you know, whip up people into this frenzy such that they were able to, you know, go and kill other people? Uh, I mean, over over years, uh, Tutsi were dehumanized. I mean, uh, they were called in Yenzi cockroaches, mm -hmm. snakes, other things like that. Uh, you know, people would just say, oh, a cockroach, you kill a cockroach, get rid of them, they're pests. You know, this sort of um, uh, casting aspersions on people. Um, and the organized nature of it was such that there's the entire Hamwe, which was this paramilitary kind of militia that was associated with the Hutu extremists, and Hutu extremists entered government, uh, but not, and also involved some Rwandan military. Mm -hmm. um, but then also local people like you and I, who then 
drank the Kool-Aid of hate, as I call it, uh, that were listening to the radio broadcasts, had gone to speeches saying these people are outsiders, are cockroaches, and they need to be gone from Rwanda and they're destroying our society. Um, and what but happened is... But not all Hutus were supportive of the genocide. No. I mean, uh, you can't use a blanket term. Mm -hmm. uh, s some people participated. Others, so-called moderate Hutus, I don't like using that term, but other people did not participate. Um, but there were, were elements who Sometimes organized. they were forced to participate, though. Yes. For example, you know, someone would come and say, you have to you know, take this machete and kill your neighbor. That's right. And they would be forced to, whether they liked it or not. That's right. And that's sort of the horrific nature of it, when mm -hmm. you're faced with that choice. Uh, I don't know what any of us would do in that situation. But yes, uh, many people were put in that situation, mm -hmm. for sure. So tell us what actually happened to people. It w I mean, from what I've read, it wasn't just that people were killed. They were killed in a very brutal fashion. Um, and women um, faced a pretty you know, harsh deal. Uh, many of them were raped, yeah. um, parts uh, of their bodies cut off, and things yeah. like that. The UN Special Rapporteur on Rwanda uh, indicated that rape was a systematic weapon used uh, it's, it, I mean, it is a war crime. It is a crime against humanity, uh, as it was used in Bosnia as well. Um, rape was used, mass killing uh, on a massive scale. Now, how did this come about? Uh, the, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, there was a civil war going on hmm. uh, in, in Rwanda, or a guerrilla action, m uh, more accurately, that the Tutsi-led Rwandan Patriotic Front was fighting this government because they wanted more rights. Um, and there was uh, likely to be a peace accord, and there were discussions of that happening. Uh, and the president of Rwanda, a Hutu, was coming back from Tanzania from the peace talks, coming back to uh, Rwanda. His plane was shot down. Mm -hmm. now, people say the RPF did it. Uh, others think the Hutu extremists did it because that triggered the genocide, that mm -hmm. plane going down. April 6th, the plane went down. April 7th, the genocide started. Um, you know, you could argue that the extremists, it worked to their favor because they did not want to share power with Tutsis and they saw this guy as giving up, uh, giving up the game. Uh, in any event, that's what triggered the genocide. But there were preparations already made. General Romeo Dallaire, who is a Canadian, uh, a stellar Canadian, a hero of the UN, who was in Rwanda leading the mission there. Because of this peace that was to come about, there's a force called UNAMIR. United uh, Nations Assistance Mission in Rwanda. He mm -hmm. headed that force of 2,700 soldiers to oversee keeping the peace during this transition. He, in January, so April 7th, 1994, the genocide sparked. January 1994, he sent a famous memo now to UN headquarters. An informant came to General Dallaire and told him, I am with the entire Hamway. I, we're stockpiling weapons. I'm training men. My men can kill about a thousand Tutsi in 20 minutes. I will show you where this stuff is, but uh, you gotta get me out of here. Mm -hmm. Delaire sent an urgent fax. It's available online. Anyone can. Everyone read it. knows about it. So what happened to his fax? They basically told him the first thing, which was a little absurd, uh, because extremists were in the government. They said, "Oh, go tell the government," mm -hmm. which didn't seem. <laughs> Uh, to be a plausible situation. And others said, no, 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 we don't need to do anything. Your mandate is just to stay put, not to intervene, not to take action. Uh, and Bel uh, Delaire was basically left, uh, hung out to dry there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he has 2,700 men. The United N States of America took active steps to neuter that force to 270 men. Mm -hmm. uh, so effectively, the world community not only looked away, they actively, uh, I think they enabled the genocide. Yeah, and the and United so States was reluctant to call it a genocide because yes. in, in that case they would be forced to act. That's right. It would have legal implications because mm -hmm. if at the UN it was declared genocide under the Genocide Convention, the contracting parties, those who are agree agreeing to the convention, which is most countries, uh, would have to act. And America had just come out of Somalia recently and they were humiliated there. They didn't want that to happen, for one. It could be that Rwandans are black and there's no oil there. Who knows what No political is. interest there. There's really nothing for America's interests. Mm -hmm. It boiled down to that kind of selfish calculation, maybe. Uh, and they left them there. Uh, military forces from the West did come into Rwanda to evacuate their Foreign citizens. Foreign nationals, yes. And Delaire had indicated that if they just those forces had stayed, 
he may have mitigated significantly or prevented the genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, there were there were heroes in the story. I mean, we don't want to make it you know very depressing. It is a depressing yes. story, but there are uplifting stories of individuals who um, try to prevent the genocide or try to help victims. Can you can you speak about that yeah. a little bit? Uh, yes, uh, certainly it's horrific what happened. It can get depressing. But what I always try to focus on is what would Zia do? What would Sophia do? You need to think about that. I'll yes. What would Zia do when that day comes here? Mm -hmm. And you need to train yourself to, to not do that. So I look to who stood out. Romeo Dallaire certainly stood out. That guy has suffered a lot, but he to the end stayed in Rwanda. He did not leave. He kept trying. Um, but one person that really stood out for me was a Senegalese soldier who was part of his force, an unarmed observer. His mandate was just to observe. His name is Captain Mbai Dian. Mm -hmm. uh, this man literally saved hundreds of people, mm -hmm. unarmed. He would literally drive to car drive loads. To che through checkpoints, That's right? That's right. I don't know how he did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark Doyle of BBC, who was a, a foreign correspondent, he was there during that whole time. He knew him. There's a great documentary online by Mark Doyle about Captain Mbai. He basically would drive to see where they were killing them through checkpoints. I don't know. He used humor. Uh, cigarette trading, all sorts of things, but this man was an amazing human being. Um, and unfortunately, in Rwanda, uh, people were killed in churches. Now, this is not to say that Muslims are uniquely better. Every religion tells you not to kill people mm -hmm. en masse. Uh, you know, that's common sense, and all our faiths say that. But remarkably, Rwanda's Muslim community, the tiny Muslim community, was mixed Hutu and Tutsi ethnicity, by and large did not participate. Maybe some Hutu Muslims did participate, but by and large, the community did not participate. Uh, and people didn't die in mosques. People were saved by they Muslims. They were sheltered in mosques. That's right. Mm -hmm. So this as, you know, it's let the Quran speak. So, <laughs> you know, we should talk about the shining examples of Muslims and how they acted. So this, Muslims do crazy stuff in the world. We could <laughs> talk about three shows of that. But, this but is right one now, instance where Muslims this is one instance well. where Muslims actually I think, lived true to their principles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something we can all learn from. Ziad, what are some practical lessons that we can take away from this Rwandan genocide? Uh, Sophia, for me, what I take away from it is, how am I going to govern myself? Now, Canada is a fantastic country. It's very safe. I, I don't foresee genocide happening here tomorrow. But I would like to think that if something like that happened, I would be opposed to it and help save others. But I compare it. Um, you know, your, mor your moral being to sort of going to the gym. You need to exercise the muscles, right? So mm -hmm. genocide is heavy lifting. Um, the Prophet had a great hadith, Prophet Muhammad, that said, if you see an injustice, any injustice, even a tiny one, change it with your hand. Do something about it to stop it. If you can't do that, speak against it. And if you can't do that, at least hate it. So for me, that's the moral gym. S you know, if you see a little injustice here in Toronto, Calgary, anywhere in North America, wherever you live, do something about it because those are the little things that will train you for when you see a big injustice you're already ready to jump you have muscle memory mm -hmm. to jump into it uh, and it can be here and abroad but get involved if you see something that's unjust speak out against it because you know there are voices as we see in Rwanda the propaganda and the other voices can overwhelm so you need to be counteract that Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you so much for speaking out on the Rwandan genocide. I really appreciate you coming on the show to speak about this topic. I'm happy to have uh, this topic aired on your show. All right, thank you. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll do a book review, How God Became Jesus.